Okay, good morning. Uh, we're just starting off here uh, class this morning on page 212. And uh, there was a question that came up last week um, about uh, about Hashem's qualities and midot and why we uh, emulate certain ones of them and not the other ones. So yeah, so it's it's uh, the, the reason why we can't emulate Hashem's qualities, qualities of like jealousy or anger or whatever is because in order to do that we need to know all of reality hmm. all of reality as it is now but all of reality and not just all of reality as has transpired since the beginning of time but all of reality as it will transpire until the end of time hmm. right because there's just too much that um we don't know meaning 99.9999% of everything we don't know. So to be able to be angry or to be jealous or whatever, the only way you could do that fairly and honestly is if you know all the details and you have all the facts, which mm -hmm. we never ever do. That's great. Thank you. But when it comes to Hashem's good midos, there we're asked to, you know, get, even though we don't have all the facts, assume positive ones, attribute positive uh, motivation to people's well-intended motivations and the truth is that most of the time people are well-intended you know they they can be really stupid and 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 make really, uh, unbelievable they be very unworked out and un insensitive but they're not usually people aren't usually usually trying to do evil or, or be or be hurtful they just um they have limitations people have a lot a lot of people are very limited um and they have their own issues of 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 wait one second i gotta figure out how to do it on my phone so well but everybody mute yourself do it second um okay ah Okay, I, I muted everybody, but please unmute yourselves and jump into the conversation. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what that's very helpful to also. People have their own trauma, people have their own insecurities, people have their own struggles, and nine times out of ten, the the negative behavior and and the things that people do come from that. You know, it comes from their own personal issues that they're struggling with. And we have to have Rahmana some people. And we have to realize that, you know, that thank God we're blessed with, you know, mental health or physical health or, or situations that for the most part are good, you know. And, um, but people have challenges, all kinds of challenges. And ones the people that we are close with have challenges that we don't even know about, you know. So we have to keep all that in mind and try to try to um, apply Rahmanas, mercy, to people and understand that you know that people are dealing with a lot of people are dealing with things and struggling with things um okay let's continue let's continue i don't like the silence now i wish i hadn't muted everybody because now it's like dead silence i feel like i'm talking to myself if you see a few smiles that helps okay um but yeah, unmute and, and and jump into the conversation over here so we can have a discussion. So 214. The Ramkal explains the difference between revenge and grudge bearing. Okay, so we spoke a little bit about this a few minutes ago, but um, the essence of taking revenge and of bearing a grudge is well known. That is, the definition of taking revenge is not only to actively harm someone who has harmed him, but even to refrain from acting benevolently to one who refused to act benevolently to him. No, I won't lend you my lawnmower because you didn't lend me your rake. Okay, or to someone who harmed him previously. And the definition of grudge bearing is to mention at the time that he's acting benevol benevolently to one who had previously harmed him or refused to act benevolently to him some allusion to the harm that he did to him. Oh yeah, I'll lend you my lawnmower. I'm not a, I don't not lend out my tools like you. I'm not, you know, greedy like you. I lend out things. Here, take my lawnmower. 
Okay, so that's the difference between um, bearing a grudge and taking revenge, as we said. They're similar, obviously, but there's a, a slight difference. Which one's worse, by the way? What do you think? What's worse? No, I won't lend you my lawnmower because you didn't lend me your rake. Or, sure, I'll lend you my lawnmower. I'm not like you who doesn't lend out his tools. <laughs> Which one's worse? I guess on one hand, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer, but on one hand, I'm thinking that it's, it's you know, the, the, the grudge is better because you are giving him the tool, right? You're, you're giving him the tool, so you're doing the kind act for him. You're just doing it with an attitude as opposed to the first case of revenge where you won't do the kind act. But on the other hand, the revenge case, at least you're not like, you just say no. And you don't necessarily add the commentary of, you know, I'm not like you. I lend my tools out. So they both have pluses and minuses, I guess. They're different. They're different, subtly different uh, issues. Okay. David, can you hear me? Yes. I, I would take the other side of that the decision, which is more lethal. On the one hand, you are criticizing the behavior. On the other hand, you're criticizing the essence of the person. I'm not like you is more intractable than you did this to me. I'm going to do the same thing to you. So you think that's worse because it has that additional component of a direct verbal attack on the person themselves. Yes. And right. And I, and I think at that point, like, do you even want his rake, his lawnmower? You know, when he says it to you like that, oh, sure, you could take my lawnmower because I'm not like you. I lend my tools out. At that point, like, I don't even want the guy's lawnmower, you know? It so, also depends upon whether or not you know whether he owns a gun. Yes, or two in some cases. That was an attempted at humor, by the way. I got it. I got it. I'm trying. I don't want public authorities at my doorstep when I go home. <laughs> well, we are we are being recorded, so you have to be careful. Um, okay, fine. Let's carry on. Page 215. Ramchal vividly describes how the evil inclination seduces the person to take revenge and bear grudges and the Torah's response to this seduction. Just want to remind you, as we said you know, a few minutes ago, um, the reason why these are so difficult and the reason why the Ramchal singles out these among all of the possible things he could have mentioned in the Torah um, and applied the principles of Nikius to he singled out specific things that are really difficult and challenging because of the resistance that we have from our own internal negative voice, the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. There are certain things about human beings that, that are so deeply hardwired and ingrained into our psyche and who we are, that they certain things just become incredibly challenging, right? This is, this is such a hard thing to do. When somebody insults you or minimizes you or embarrasses you or does something in some way that just cuts at your ego and your and your sense of self. It is a a monstrous task. The Torah is is requiring and demanding superhuman, angelic response responses from us, because the Yitzhahara is so strong. It's such a it's such a powerful force within us to respond the wrong way in these situations. Obviously, a person who has a stronger sense of self-worth, person who has developed and worked on their um, you know, self-confidence and their, and their feeling of self-worth, independent of um, other people and the praises and the accolades and the whatever we may get from other people to build up our self-confidence, but they've developed true self-worth, which is not contingent, not connected to what other people say or think about us. 
So a person who's reached that or worked on that and developed that within themselves through therapy or through their own, you know, hard work. So they're going to be able to handle these types of situations better. Okay. Because they're, they've learned through their own effort and their own work, not to take things personally, not to, uh, you know, see that person's comments as a, as a, as a direct diminishment of who I am but rather more of a reflection of some shortcoming that they have, okay? But still, nonetheless, either way, it's hard. It's really hard. So the Ramchal continues, says, since the evil inclination constantly inflames the heart of a person about past wrongs done to him and always seeks to preserve at least some trace or some recollection of the matter, we never truly... Let, the, let these things go entirely. And if it is unable to preserve an, an intense recollection, the Yitzhar will, it will try to preserve at least a minor recollection, right? The Yitzhar will try to get you to hold on to it at least some way. It's still there. I'm over it, but I still remember it. I haven't completely erased it from my mind and my heart. Ideally, I would sit down with the person. I would say, I, I want to share with you just, I have to tell you this, I have to get this off my chest. What you said really hurt a lot. It, it really, it really made me feel bad and it was really di- painful. And, and I, it was really, I felt it was very not nice. And I just needed to tell you that. Okay. And now that I've told you that I, I ideally I've er- completely erased it from my mind and my, I, I shared it. I got it out. Like Alan was saying, don't hold it in. Torah doesn't want you to hold it in. I let it out. I shared it. But now, let it go 100%. That's what the Torah expects and demands and require, requests. Absolutely. But the Torah is not so quick to uh, give you that gift of total release and forgetful, forgetting the ex- experience. It will either, pre- it will either pervert, preserve it intensely or at the very least, it will try to preserve a minor recollection. Okay, so that's why the Torah found it necessary to counter this incitement. It's amazing. amazing. That's, that's the most amazing sentence. The Hashem created with us with a Yitzhahara, which we can talk about in a minute. We can take a step back and ask why, which we will, we will in a second. But for now, Hashem created us with a Yitzhahara, a negative drive, an intensely negative drive voice inside of us and then he gave us the torah as the antidote to the attempt and the uh the conniving uh machinations of the Yitzhar to bring us down and to destroy us and to, to take away our joie de vie and everything that's good in our lives the torah gave us the remedy for that and in this case, the remedy is the Torah says to the person, um, you know, um, here, the, the, the evil condition will, for example, tell a person, if you insist on giving this to, uh, if you insist on giving to this man that which he refused to give to you when you needed it, then at the very least, do not give it to him with a pleasant demeanor. Don't give him the lawnmower and say, here. You know what? Enjoy it. I hope your, your lawn, your, uh, you know, your lawn looks beautiful. I'm, 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 you know, enjoy it. Here's the lawnmower. Whenever you're done, you can bring it back. No, don't do that. You get it. You can't give it to him with a pleasant demeanor or if someone did not merely refuse to help you, but actually caused you harm. Evil inclination might uh, contend if you refuse to act maliciously to him, then when he asks for your help, at least do not render him a significant kindness. But OK, fine. You don't, you're a baby, baby. You don't want to take revenge. Okay, you don't want to hurt him. Fine, be a baby. But at least don't, you know, don't do anything nice for him or don't provide him with any assistance. Or the evil inclination will argue, even if you insist on significantly significantly insisting him, right? Because you're such a pathetic wimp, is the Yetzirah talking to you, right? At the very least, do not do this in his presence giving him the impression that you took no offense to his ill treatment of you. Or perhaps the evil inclination inclination might argue, at least do not revert to associating with him and becoming his friend. Definitely don't do that. 
or if you've forgiven him to the point where you no longer appear to him as an enemy, that that's enough, right? Like that's okay. That that fine. Like just don't be his enemy. But if and if you insist on associating him one, with him once again, at least do not show him uh, the same degree of affection as before. Like don't totally completely let it go. And so it is with all kinds of similar tactics from among the many strategies of the evil inclination with which it strives to seduce the hearts of people. Therefore, to counter all of these arguments, the Torah came immediately after the verse prohibiting revenge and bearing a grudge and set forth a rule that is all-encompassing. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The, the order over here is what the Ramchal is commenting on. The order is amazing. The order is so perfect. Don't hate your brother, fellow in, in your heart. Don't bear a grudge. Don't take revenge. And then the Torah says the next verse, and you shall love your fellow man as yourself. Meaning th th this is a, an, an, an outright um, challenge to the Yetzirah. You know what? Shut up. Don't put all of your all of your arguments and all of your you know attempts to to knock me out and to cause me to be less of a human being than i can and just take them somewhere else i'm not interested because the torah tells me i have to love everybody else like i love myself just like i give myself the benefit of the doubt when i'm in a bad mood i cut myself some slack when i'm feeling down or feeling low I lower my expectations for myself for that day, whatever. So too, look at another person that way. Understand that that people are not always their their best selves. You know, people say things and do things not because they, you know, don't take it so personally because things are going on in their lives that you don't know about. You should love somebody like you love yourself. Cut them some slack, okay? Um, when the Torah says as yourself, it means as yourself with no difference at all, because your love for him and your love for yourself, uh, between, no difference in your love for him and your love for yourself, as yourself with no distinctions between you and him, with no ruses and machinations. Oh, that was my word. Against him. Rather, you shall love your fellow exactly as yourself. I want to read the note down here for a minute. This verse does not merely define the extent of the requirement to avoid revenge and grudge bearing but actually provides a tool with which to do so. Right? This verse is not just telling us how far we have to go in overcoming our tendency to bear grudge, but it's actually helping us. It's actually teaching us a trick, which is what? If one comes to truly love your fellow as yourself, you will not be tempted to seek revenge or bear even the slightest grudge for any wrong that his fellow may have done. The Yushalmi, that's the Jerusalem Talmud, explains this by means of the following parable. If a person were cutting meat, it's a famous, famous analogy, with a knife in one hand and inadvertently slashed his other hand, you know, ah, you cut yourself with the knife, would you take revenge on the offending hand and slash it in return? Switch the knife into your other hand and cut your hand for cutting your hand? All right, similarly, all our people are elements of a single body. And by internalizing this truth, and one comes to realize that he should not even consider taking revenge for his fellow, for it is tantamount to taking revenge on himself. Why? Because every Jewish person on a very deep spiritual Kabbalistic level, we are really just one person. All of our souls, all of our neshamas are connected and intertwined and joined together with one another on the very, very high level. The soul has many levels. There are an infinite number of levels to the soul, but there are five primary levels of the soul. And on the highest level of the soul, every Jewish soul is really one soul. So we are really one person. We may look different, we may think different, we may act differently, but every Jewish person is connected spiritually on the highest level as one. It's called Knesset Israel. It's the conglomerate of the Jewish people, which, by the way, is the reason why the Torah doesn't demand or require this level of perfection from us when it comes to non-Jews. Of course, the Torah doesn't ever allow us to wrong a non-Jew or to actively harm a non-Jew or to cheat or to steal or anything. 
but this this incredibly high level of demand of don't even carry around anger towards them don't bear a grudge that is only expected or required of us vis-a-vis another Jewish person. And the reason for that is because the only reason why that's even possible, the only way that it's even humanly possible to achieve what is basically angelic behavior of not responding to being harmed is because of the truth and the fact that we are all really the same person. And because with Jews, all Jewish neshamas are connected. All Jewish souls are connected on the highest level. So because of that, that's the reason why it's even possible. Because if I stop and think, oh my gosh, that person is me. They're just another hand. It makes no sense for me to take the knife and cut the hand, the other hand, because that hand cut me. That makes no sense, right? That's only true between Jew and Jew. So this level, this high, high, high required level of of spiritual greatness only applies um, between me and a fellow Jew for that reason. Okay? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, there's a big difference between someone not saying hello to you in a restaurant and someone impugning your integrity uh, cheating you at business, costing you millions of dollars. So if you really get screwed by someone, uh, it, I, you know, I mean, I don't think you can forgive them. You might be able to say, okay, I'm not going to have any contact with him. I'm not going to let him, you know, eat of my in my insides. But there's no way I'm going to forgive him. I'm just going to blot him out of my life. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Because well, not saying hello at a restaurant, big deal, you know. Right. A, a liar or something or whatever. It's a huge different difference to me. Yeah. So first of all, if there's a financial uh, component to it, meaning that the person, like you said, cheated me out of money or stole from me or whatever, then of course there's legal re- recourse for that. You take the person to the bait din to the to the court, you know, Jewish court or whatever, and and you demand, you know, compensation. You demand uh, reparations for the financial harm that they caused you. Um, so, so it doesn't mean that you have to forgive people for causing you financial harm. It means that the. It doesn't mean that. It it means it doesn't mean that you have to um, forgive the money that they owe you or 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 give up on going and trying to demand or or, or get the money back. But it could mean that you have to try to work on, let's say, you know, you've gone to the court and you've gotten your money back and, and they've paid you what they stole from you. Now the challenge is how do I move on and let go of what happened, you know? And um, yeah, it's obviously a lot harder when the insult is greater, you know, if a person directly, you know, attacks your character or whatever, it's a lot harder than, somebody who didn't say hello to you in the restaurant but at the same time that person too i have to work on figuring out how to let it go just you know and the easiest way for me in my own experience is always just to say like nebuch i feel so bad for that person obviously there's something so not right inside of that person that would cause them to say that or do that or think that about me you know, I guess first, maybe the first step is to self-reflect and, and to do some chuba and think, is there something that I'm actually doing wrong? Maybe he's right. Maybe I, maybe there is something about the way I am or what I'm doing or the way I, I interact with people that is problematic or difficult. I feel that a lot of times people don't have the ability to self-reflect and look and ask themselves, you know, why is this happening to me? You know, what am I doing wrong? I see that a lot where like, you know, the, the initial re- at reaction of somebody is to lash out, you know, why didn't, you know, there are examples. I don't, I don't want to give any specific examples because people might know what I'm talking about, but, but there, you know, even recently there've been examples where people have been upset or hurt by, you know, something that's happened to them and, and, but it's like recurring patterns of, of behavior that like, you know, somebody who, who, 
this kind of thing happens to them over and over again. Are, well, are you self-reflecting? Are you asking yourself questions? Is there something that I'm doing? Is there something about me and the way I am in the world that's causing you know this type of reaction to happen to me over and over again? Not a chance. You know, that's true. Though. That's really hard to do, right? Most people can't do that and won't do that. But um, but then the next level is okay, you know. Um, I just feel bad for this person, you know, may, maybe this, per, you know, there's something clearly not right for this person, something going on in this person's emotional reality that's, that's really, you know, causing them to, to act and act out in these really negative ways. But, um, you know, nebuch, like, I just, I feel bad for that person. Life's too short to be angry and bear grudge. Doesn't mean I have to go around and be his very, very best friend ever. But I, I, the Torah isn't requiring or requesting of me to try to at least, at the very least, get back to a, uh, you know, parf situation with him where I don't, you know, where, where the negative charge has been removed. Um, but yeah, of course, it's, it's not, that's, that's certainly not easy. David? Yeah. A question. I'm a little uncomfortable with the sense that it's some highest level, all of humanity is not linked together. And I'm wondering if the following interpretation is consistent with what you said. We have, as Jews, a special purpose to serve as an example in the way we live our lives with regard to God's will. And that means that our actions with each other as examples is more stringent because we carry this responsibility rather than a superiority. So that we impose a higher level of expectation for Jews among Jews than we might for Jews with Gentiles because of that purpose, that responsibility that we have as Jews. So I think what you're saying is 100% correct, and and that would be I would say the the common the more the more typical explanation of why certain laws in the Torah apply between only between Jews. Like for example, the classic example is the prohibition against lending money on interest. Jews are, Jews are not allowed to lend money on interest to another Jew. Okay, and and the reason for that is like you're saying is because like. You know, um, lending money on interest is a very normal thing to do, right? If you want me to lend you money, that means I have to take my money unless it's liquid and doing nothing. But usually people don't have keep a lot of money liquid. They want their money to be doing something. So it means I'd have to take money out of some investment, which at least theoretically is 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 making some money. And I'm going to lend it to you. So at the very least, I should be able to get the interest from you that you know i'd be I, I could be getting if i have money in a cd or something right but the torah says no when you lend money to another jew you have to lend it to them interest free so that's not a requirement that's placed upon us when we lend money to non-jews only when we lend money to jews and the reason for that is because the expectation is higher like you're saying that's the expect expectation that we treat each other in a beyond the letter of the law type of way is um is in fact like becomes the letter of the law when it comes to between jews and jews but it's really objectively it's beyond the letter of the law it's just that we're expected to do beyond the letter of the law when it comes to between jews and fellow jews that's that's right so what you're saying is totally true i was just saying in addition to that i think it's there, there's a spiritual reason for it too which is that all of our neshamos all of our souls are are connected to one another to form one body and one unit. And therefore, on the deepest, deepest spiritual level, you and I are really two, just two cells in the same body. And, and therefore, you know, it doesn't make any logical sense to cause harm or to do anything other than to support another Jew because we're really just one, we, we form one body together. Okay, this is a good place to stop. Um, and uh, we will continue next week. For the guys who are here from the Shiva,
I'll send out, a, I'm going to send you a message later about tomorrow. I have a, a little conflict with tomorrow because tomorrow is Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day. And um, there are just, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of activities going on in Jerusalem downtown celebrating the unification of Jerusalem that are going to be taking place in afternoon and evening. And I, and I don't know what, what is going to be expected of me, the kid, you know, all the kids are home from school and everything. So I have to see um, what's possible. So I'll, I'll send you a message later tonight or sometime to later today to let you know what's going on for tomorrow. Dave, uh, Dave are you planning to teach next Wednesday in light of the uh, fundraiser? Um, probably, yeah. Good. Hopefully, oh. you'll get supported with. Uh, yeah. Big By the way, the, the the our annual campaign, our big annual fundraising campaign, um, is starting next week on Tuesday at eleven a.m. Chicago time, and will go until Wednesday eight p.m. And it's our one fundraiser of the year where all donations that are given during that time are doubled by a group of matching donors who are who have agreed to match all donations made during that period of time. So it's really like the the ultimate time to contribute and help support the Heim Center so that we can have the funds that we need to do all the amazing things that we're doing. Um, and that's like double the impact during those during those hours so look out you'll you'll get a you'll get enough emails from me trust me emails whatsapps messages um so you'll be uh you'll be well informed about it but keep an eye out for that but uh, yeah i think we'll have class that should be fine have you published information about the link that we can use in our appeal emails that we send out i i've sent that to you by email you should have that in your uh Check your emails. You should have, I've been the last couple of days, yesterday and today, I sent out um, all of the information for the ambassadors. If you don't see it, Les, let me know and I'll, and I'll make sure you, but you should, it should be. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody. It's fun. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. All the best.